In this mini lecture, we're going to move away from the developmental theories and start focusing on one of the contemporary theories of career development, the career construction theory of Mark Savickas. This happens with a bit of a brief glance upon uh, the two philosophical paradigms that divide the field, namely modernism and postmodernism. Up until the late 90s, all career development theories adhered to what is known as the modernist frame. Okay? This means that the Hersonian approach, the test and tell approach, or the trait and factor theories, including Holland's theory, or developmental theories such as Super's theory or even John Crumble's learning theories, were all following the same modernist philosophical framework in explaining this phenomenon known as career development. But with the rise of postmodernism in the 80s and then later more in the 90s and how new theoretical frameworks were needed to explain human behavior across the lifespan and its development, the career field also needed to adjust. All right? So new career theories based on postmodernism started to emerge in the late 90s and then more of them in the 2000s. Before talking about postmodernism, it's important to attend to modernism. We haven't talked about it. What was this philosophical ground on which all those previous theories, including the ones that we have already covered so far in this course, were developed upon? All right, so we need to talk about modernism that was informing the theories that we've covered so far. Okay, modernism concerns itself with a logical positivist way of looking at life and human behavior. What does that mean? It has served us well in many disciplines, such as the health sciences and physics and chemistry and biology and all that. But when it comes to social sciences, it starts to feel a bit shaky and unreliable at times. So it was logical positivism that informed ideas such as the Personian approach, the trait and factor theories. Remember the idea of matching people with a career based on measuring some things in the person and some things in a chosen environment. Logical positivism assumes that there is truth out there, that we just need to do more and more observations and experiments and testing and measuring. And eventually we will get to know the core of things. We will be able to reveal the truth of that thing we are studying. This is contested by postmodernist thinkers. We'll see later. The other assumption of modernism, or logical positivism, we better say, is that we should only use the scientific and empirical methods to understand phenomena. That whatever that is knowable through this empirical method is worth investigating and knowing about, and everything that is not possible to generate knowledge of based on the empirical, or better say, objectivist methods, shouldn't be the concern of social sciences. This is also contested by postmodernism, and hopefully you'll see how. And finally, based on the two previous assumptions, one of the other characteristics of modernism is its tendency to be reductionist. If you notice, for example, the career theories that we have covered so far, they try to reduce all human behavior to a set of generalizable statements. They may know that, for example, the career development of many groups of people may not be explained with their theory, but still they propose a theory that appears to be all-inclusive. For example, when you consider people with disabilities or the LGBTQI or migrants or the career development of people who live in many other countries around the world with different cultures or economic structures or the career development of people who are facing many disadvantages in their life, you see that those theories do not account for these people's complexities and exceptional circumstances. But we know that these are exactly the sort of people for which we need the theories to be able to support their career development. Anyway, let's just say that this reductionist approach of the modern theories was also problematic. But what also came out of this reductionist tendencies and pure reliance on the empirical method was that people were reduced to scores and numbers when it came to assisting them with a career pathway. Right? As you are now familiar with all the tests and scores we have shown you, the career field is perhaps one of those helping professions that has more scales and tests and measures than any other field. And this was becoming redundant as we entered a new world of work in the 21st century, 
testing and telling people what pathway to follow for the rest of their life was starting to not make sense anymore. And this is when we get to postmodernism. I don't want to get into all the philosophical details around postmodernism, but let's just say two of the main philosophical positions that shape postmodernism or social constructionism and constructivism. Okay, social constructionism is basically about how the social world, the environment around us, determines our access, our entry, our way of knowing the world, okay, our access to the world. For example, language is a way of communication. But what language we use at which point in time in history has a major role in how we perceive the social reality of our lives. Social constructionism is also about how the social world influences us through what is known as socialization. That we, for example, go to school, we meet new people, we grow up while accepting norms and rules of how lives should be lived through our parents, maybe through unwritten rules in society that we grow up, that we all have inevitably kind of agreed upon those rules and norms. There is also constructivism, and many consider these two, constructivism and social constructionism, um, as very similar or maybe the same, but that's not exactly correct. As constructivism is mostly about the internal process of how a person makes sense of what they know. All right, the internal process. Yes, you have been exposed to a large number of events out there, incidents, stories in your life, people. But how each of us makes sense of those events is going to be pretty different internally. And that is exactly what constructivism attends to. Okay, so a bit beyond social constructionism and constructivism, postmodernism, the assumptions of it, is that it entails that there are no fixed, stable truths. All right, that people perceive and construct their own uh, social reality. They do this act of constructing their own social reality through interaction with others at different life contexts. Okay, the life contexts matter a lot here. This means that there is no one truth, and instead there are multiple stories that can be said about a person or about an event. So the assumptions we can say postmodernism has are that each person has their own unique perceptions based on whatever is available to them in their contexts and cultures. This uniqueness of every individual is very important in postmodernism. That people's behavior is not reducible. Remember reductionism? That people's behavior is not reducible to a set of generalized statements. It also goes further and says that People construct their own unique view of the world based on their unique perceptions. All right. So this unique view of the world um, is basically the stories that we hold about ourselves, who we are, what we are, what we are capable of or interested in or value. All right. And also stories about the world we live in and uh, about the other people in this world. All right. This is about the next assumption that people attach their own personal meaning to their unique way of the world. Person's A view is unique. Person's B view is also unique in a different way. But then each of them might then also interpret those views differently than you may interpret it. Okay, so even if you have access to those views, the interpretation of them is different. And that's precisely what constructivism is interested in. This interpretation is related to the act of ascribing meaning. And finally, it might be obvious that based on such unique views, unique perceptions, meaning makings, people's stories affects their behaviors, including their career behavior, the choices they make, for example. So postmodernism is started to exert its influence on the career development field, and it somehow began with Mark Savickas's career construction theory. Career construction theory became a very popular theory in the early 2000s, and its influence is still continues. He minimized the idea that traits can be measured and then matched to occupation. All right? This notion that was highlighted by Savikas was very topical back in the early 2000s, because we know that the 21st century 
There's too much change for us to be able to make matches that are going to be stable over an entire lifespan. So if you think back to what we talked about in module one, we talked about the world of work rapidly changing because of forces like globalization, digital disruption, automation, changing nature of jobs. And so we don't know what jobs are going to be there in five or 10 years time. We don't know the tasks of a teacher a lot in 10 years time. All right. So a lot of things could change. So we can't make these matches that are going to be stable. Uh, think about all the non-linearity that exists in the world of work. So matching doesn't work for a 21st century world of work. In this sort of situation, Savica says the self isn't something to be discovered, but it's instead something that is actively constructed and revised over time through these stories we create, we construct about our experiences. So self is actively constructed. So the notion of a fixed identity was challenged by postmodernism, you see, and this is also its reflection here in the career development field, that people don't have a fixed or a static identity or personality that remains the same across the lifespan. This way, then measuring those personality or values won't always help determine a choice of a lifetime career. So postmodernism proposed the idea of a narrative identity instead, that our identity is tied to these stories that we construct and hold about ourselves. And as these stories change, so does our identity. Mark Savickas uh, was Donald Super's student, and so because of that, there's a lot of uh, reflections of Super's influence in his work. He still retains the idea of self-concept as central, but is more interested in the idea of that construct itself, that life story that people construct that gives them meaning in life. He sees choices that people make in their life as expressions or manifestations of that self-concept or their multiple self-concepts in the same way that Super did. All right. And we should consider again why these changes were being noted by Savikas compared to Super. Savikas was observing the rapidly changing world of work in the 90s. And then things really started to pick up um, speed in the early 2000s. So his theory was gaining more and more attention as that idea of a stable lifetime career was disappearing year after year. And instead, the new world of work was a place where people had to constantly make meaning of their location in the fast changing world around them. So through this meaning making, through this restoring of our narrative identity, people could be equipped to survive all these disruptions, all right, all these career changes, all these phases where they go unemployed, for example, or have to do things that are not exactly aligned with what they did in the past or the education they had, for example. So Savikas's theory was emerging on the backdrop of all these global and societal changes. The career construction theory is generally explained through these three constructs that are life themes, vocational personality, and career adaptability. We will go through each of them quickly here and clarify some links between them and the overall notion of this theory being informed by constructivism and social constructions. The first construct here is this idea of life themes. This is heavily linked with postmodernism and that notion of narrative identity. So every person has some life themes that emerge from the life story, from the life story that we tell about ourselves. Okay, And this is changeable across the lifespan. And whatever the life themes are, they influence the essential meanings of a career and its construction. It is basically these life themes that predominantly guide people in doing what they think is preferable to be done. Okay. There's an emphasis on people's stories and how they tell their stories and what is included in there. So a lot of Savikas approach to career counseling focuses on inviting people to tell their life stories so that he can start to pull out these life themes because that's going to give them some starting material about the sort of life themes or preoccupations, uh, let's say, that this person has. So the career counseling evolves around having conversations around those life themes, those preoccupations that this person has. These will be then the essential meanings that influence this client's choice of a career. Life themes can be both positive and negative, obviously. They can be problems or preoccupations that need to be resolved or attended to, or values that need to be expressed somehow through work. And so these life themes reflect the drive to express self-concepts. 
The next one is vocational personality. So like Holland, he talked about career-related abilities, needs, values, and interests as being part of this vocational personality. He saw those as being reflected when we hear about a person's life themes. All right. So he very much was interested in abstracting out these life themes, these really important big themes that he sees people constructing in their life, playing out in their life, that seem to be the meaning that people construct for themselves. And then he saw that those needs or values or interests um, that vocational personality in short reflect themselves in the life themes that have been developed up until this point that people are in at their life. However, he differs from Holland as he emphasizes why people engage in a specific vocational behavior. And he, he says that it is to express a life theme. All right. So he says that idea of people constructing their narrative identity and that personal unique meaning of life that they construct is influencing their behavior and therefore influencing the sort of vocational choices they make, the vocational behaviors that they would like to engage in. So Holland really was just interested in measuring and matching, but Savikas wants to know why. Because if the career counselor can help the person learn why and how did they end up having such life themes and such vocational personality, then they will be on their way to make this analysis again and again in their life when needed, if needed. Remember, the 21st century is all about changing jobs, changing careers, disruption. So people can't basically come to career counselor every week. Right? People need to be equipped with an understanding of how this thing emerges and evolves, how this unpacking of a life theme and career development work. He says personality is a dynamic process that presents possibilities. He doesn't see personality as a set of stable traits that predict the future. He sees it as being an ongoing construction that we engage in over our lives. And finally, the third major construct of Savikas' theory is career adaptability. Super also talked about this notion of adaptability, but Savikas took that concept a lot further using the postmodern lens. And adaptability gained a lot more attention in 21st century kind of context that adaptivity and adaptation were highlighted for people. So adaptability refers to a person's coping resources, how able they are to adapt to the very rapid rate of change that the 21st century is throwing at people. You may better remember career adaptability by these five C's. These are basically the how of performing career development in the 21st century that if one is to successfully develop a career in these times, one needs to attend to all of these five Cs. There is concern, control, curiosity, confidence, and cooperation. And concern is about the idea that people should have a good degree of concern about their vocational future. Control is when people feel that they have a degree of control over their future. Curiosity is about people wanting to explore the self and future scenarios, future possibilities and future life themes. It's about that desire to want to explore. Confidence is that they express a degree of confidence in their ability to pursue the aspirations that they have. All right. And finally, cooperation is about people recognizing the role of interactions with other people in how they learn about possibilities, how those interactions could also support them in attending to their career plans and achieving their career goals. Generally speaking, one could say that increasing career adaptability is perhaps uh, the central goal of career counseling informed by Savikas' theory, but mostly career counseling informed by his theory and a few other postmodern theories that emerged in the last 15 years or so, they are referred to as narrative career counseling, which is about facilitating career is storytelling. And then through this storytelling, people get to the point of understanding self and understanding their best pathways in this context. So we will talk more about narrative career counseling in module nine, but the next mini lecture focuses a bit narrowly and more briefly on the introduction of career counseling that is solely informed by the career construction theory of Mark Savickas.